All right, well, good morning, River. Good morning, River family. Get everything set. So, I am the preacher today. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> so, if you guys don't know me, my name is Tyler Mullenkamp. I am the student director here at the River. And today, Pastor Josh is out of town. He is taking a much needed vacation. And surprisingly, things are still working around here. And surprisingly, I haven't burned this place down completely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. And so, yes, <laughs> um, I've been working here at the river for about six months now. And seriously, it's my dream job. I love it. My job here at the river involves taking care of the kids anywhere from ages like nursery until high school. So it's a huge, huge age range, and I love it. I love it so much. So while I'm not a father, I do consider the 30-some kids under me to be pretty much my own kids, and I love them a lot, my adopted kids in a sense. And so to let you experience my given any Sunday, um, here's how my warnings work. So one moment, I could be changing a baby's diaper, while the other moment, taking a high, or talking to a high schooler about maybe having coffee that next week. Um, one moment, um, helping a preschooler up from being pushed down, and then the other moment, have glue shoved up my nose during craft time. <laughs> one moment, um, uh, maybe talking with parents or volunteers, just going through their struggles, and the next moment, hitting kids with dodgeballs in the gym back here. So <laughs> it may sound brutal, but it's fun, and they're soft, so don't worry. <laughs> so to be honest, I couldn't do it without my countless nursery, pre-K, kindergarten, and elementary workers. They're, they're an amazing help and I couldn't do it by myself. You know, it's a passion of mine and a passion of the workers uh, for us to see the kids grow up in a relationship with Christ and to help the parents work alongside of them and guide them as they have pretty much more difficult of a job than me or the sponsors or the volunteers is what I call them. And so, just a little bit about me. I recently moved here to Iowa City from the Detroit area in Michigan. I'd grown up, I have grown up there all my life, and no, it's not as thug as you may seem it is. And this last spring, I graduated with a bachelor's of, um, in religious studies from Southern Evangelical Seminary. And I may have lost all of you in that name, but it's a famous school down in North Carolina where um, a really, really good apologist named Norman Geisler, he actually created and started the school. So a great, great school where I was trained at. And so last, here are three random things about myself, just so you can understand who I am. So one, I live and breathe the outdoors everything. So camping, hiking, mountain biking, all of the above. So I love it. You know, in our tech-savvy world, it's, it's always refreshing to take a step outside. You know, sometimes I see high schoolers just walking around texting on their phones while they're outside. You know, sometimes I just want to say, look up and actually understand what's in front of you. It's the outdoors. It's amazing and free. Most importantly, free. Uh, number two, if you don't think Jimmy Fallon is the best late-night TV host, then I don't think we can be friends. <laughs> and three... Um, just to get out in the clear, yes, I look like a high schooler. No, I am not one. <laughs> uh, later this month, I'm going to be turn I'm going to be turning 22, and yes, I'm young enough to possibly be one of your sons. But I stand here today to preach with a godly conviction, and the fact that Josh is gone, but a godly conviction nonetheless. <laughs> and so today, we're going to be continuing our summer in Psalms series. No, oh, let me just go back there. So we're going to be continuing that. We've been running through the Psalms for about two months now here at the river, and I think Josh has done an awesome, awesome job. I love the way that he goes into the text, gets into the his historical context, and really gets the meat of the scripture out. And the Psalms, you know, they have different meanings for different people. Maybe you go to them in your struggles. Maybe you go to them in your joys or your celebrations. Or maybe you just use them as a reference to know where in the world you are in the Bible. <laughs> and so whatever way you read them, God has inspired the men who have written these books for two purposes. To help us express ourselves to God and to consider God's ways. So therefore, the Psalms are of great benefit to the believer who looks to the Bible for help in expressing joys and sorrows, successes and failures, hopes and regrets, or simply just to worship. And so today we're going to be looking through Psalm 62. 
Uh, we're going to be looking through why, I, why in the world I chose this one, what the historical context of it is, and how it matters to us in August of 2015. So I've chosen Psalm 62. Why, you ask? I'm happy you did. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Last summer, I was able to work as a teen counselor at a Christian camp named Northland Camp and Conference Center. This is actually a place where I met my girlfriend here in the front row who is playing piano beautifully up here. So I met her there, and it was a great, great summer. I, you know, I walked away from this camp understanding one tremendous idea that I really never fully realized. You know, this wasn't how amazing the games could be at camp. This wasn't how professional the music could be, or even how to lead a Bible study for that matter. This one thing was community. You know, I learned that true, open, and sincere community is only found in the body of Christ. Not in the bars after you've had a couple of beers, or not in sports teams while you may have shared sweat and tears and maybe even blood sometimes with these people, or not even in the armed forces where you're literally laying down your life for your brothers and sisters, your comrades. This community is found in the body of Christ. And so this is where you're going to open, this is where you openly share your struggles and joys with those who share that same bond in Christ. So I'll give you an example. So for the sake of my friend's identity, uh, we're going to call him Tim. So Tim, I had never met before, before even coming to camp. I met him my first week. You know, there was no small talk about the weather. We didn't talk about the sports. But he told me of his background and how he had grown up going from foster home to foster home without parents at all. You know, moving from these homes, he constantly struggled to find a place to belong. He struggled to find the finances to even find direction, and he eventually found his place at this camp, Northland, which is also a school as well. And story after story, you know, he poured out his heart to me. He shared his struggles with me, yet each story he told each story, as they like these horrible, horrible stories, he let these bullets just whiz past him, all these difficulties, and he consistently recited one verse to me. And go figure, it was from the Psalms, which kind of connects it with. So Psalm 62, 2, this is the one he constantly recited. It says, he alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. So I, I played this over and over in my mind, uh, even after camp, through my difficulties as well. And so uh, now my brother in Christ, Tim, is continuing to follow after God's own heart. Praise God. And I consider him to, in a sense, be my BFF in Christ. Um, and that's only because of the community that's only found in the body of Christ. Any other bond outside of that is just a shadow of the real object of community, of the real deal. So if you can open your Bibles with me, we're going to dive into Psalm 62 right now. But before, before um, we read the psalm, I'm going to ask you all to do something for me. And yes, I'm incorporating some children's ministry into this. I need you all to take off your 2015 lenses off and slap on your ancient lenses, because we're going to understand the real historical context of these verses. So everybody take off your 2015 lenses and slap them on. Um, so verse 1 here, we're going to start. Psalm 62. I am at rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will never be shaken. How long will you threaten a man? Will all of you attack as if he were a leaning wall or a tottering stone fence? They only plan to bring him down from his high position. They take pleasure in lying. They bless with their mouths, but they curse inwardly. Rest in God alone, my soul, for my hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will never be shaken. My salvation and glory depend on God, my strong rock. My refuge is in God. Let me get it here. Trust in him at all times. If you can go to the next slide. I'm not sure what's going on here. There it is. So trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts before him. God is our refuge. 
Men are only a vapor, exalted men an illusion. Weight in the scales, they go up. Together they are less than a vapor. Place no trust in oppression or false hope and robbery. If wealth increases, pay no attention to it. God has spoken once. I have heard this twice. Strength belongs to God. And faithful love belongs to you, Lord, for you repay each according to his works. So again, the phrase, I will never be shaken, jumps off the page as like a living portion of this psalm. It's a strong statement, isn't it? You know, I will never be shaken. Should we really take that literally? Was David really this, um, this strong castle, this amazingly strong person um, that wasn't bothered by life circumstances? You know, life eventually throws things at you. Hard times will come. That's inevitable. It's a definite. If you think financial success or personal health or occupational security are a right from God, I'm sorry, but this life is sadly going to let you down. No, I don't believe David was the strong tower that we're talking about here. I am convinced that there is a lesson in this psalm for you and for me that's far more powerful than just to believe that we can have a Teflon heart and mind that deflects every heartbreaking and nerve-shattering situation that we encounter in life. So uh, let me explain. Given that the Bible commentators are correct and historical documentation are reliable, this psalm was written when David was on the run for his life from his own son, Absalom. If this is true, then we have an actual written record of what was actually going on in David's mind. Now, if it wasn't this certain situation, then we still have a little insight to what was going on in David's mind because there's multiple other psalms that are based on 2 Samuel or the Kings. So we can read this whole story in 2 Samuel 13 through 19. You can open it up there, but I'm going to slap it right here up on the screen. Now, I need you to stay with me because this family tree gets a little complicated. There's some drama kind of mixed in here. Everybody loves drama. So David had three children by his wife, Maka. Now, David had more than one, one wife. That's kind of what they did back in the Old Testament. So he had three children by his wife, Maka. The story from 2 Samuel involves two of her children. Their names were Tamer and Absalom. Now, David had a son named Amnon. By, a water, by another wife named Ahinoam. So Amnon was this half-brother of Tamer and Absalom. Now, Amnon was infuriated, or sorry, he was infatuated by Tamer, and he told his friends, which is found in 2 Samuel 13, 4, I'm in love with Tamer, my brother Absalom's sister. This is a little creepy. So Amnon was so obsessed and preoccupied by his thoughts of Tamer that it literally made him sick. It was a disaster in the making that eventually led to Amnon raping his half-sister, Tamer. Maka and her brother, Absalom, or sorry, Tamar's mother, Maka, and Absalom um, complained to David because he didn't even do anything about this. And in 2 Samuel 13, 21, it says this, when, da when King David heard about all these things, he was furious. Absalom didn't say anything to Amnon, either good or bad, because he hated Amnon since he disgraced his sister Tamer. You know, the bitterness and the rage grew and grew inside Absalom for, um, for two years after Tamer's rape. And so when it all culminates, Absalom eventually kills his brother Amnon. And when David heard about Amnon's death, we read that he mourned many days for his son. Let's look at verse 38 here. It says, after Absalom fled and went to Gesher, he stayed there three years. And King David longed to go to Absalom, for he was consoled considering Amnon's death. So once he killed his brother, Absalom went to live among his mother's family. And this was for three years in Gesher, where his grandfather Talmai was king. So three years. You know, at some point, David's thoughts turned from the grief that he was suffering from Amnon's death to the loss of his own son, Absalom. So jump into David's shoes right now. Just consider what he would be thinking. Perhaps he felt as if he were part responsible for Amnon's death because he'd really never addressed the situation. He didn't say anything. I'm sure David's thoughts were continually occupied with these family issues. You know, this is some serious drama. I can imagine he had a hard time sleeping at night, you know, constantly thinking about this. 
It says, King David longed to go see Absalom, but he never went to see his own son. Absalom's bitterness grew and grew inside him. This is pretty much an intensified situation as that of your ability to call your mother-in-law, possibly, or talk to an extended family member that maybe you have some drama with. The fact of the matter is that, com that, is that communication helps any relationship out there. You talk with your wife, you're gonna understand what she's thinking. You talk with your mother-in-law, yes, intentionally, she'll feel emotionally closer to you. And you talk with God, God, known as prayer, and your love for him will grow without bounds. You know, David did not ad address the situation and it negatively affected his relationship between him and his son. And so finally, after three years, Joab, David's right-hand man, convinced David to bring Absalom back to Jerusalem. But David was clear that Absalom was to live in his own house and never again come to the royal palace. Two more years passed, and finally Absalom sent for Joab. Just as anyone else in this situation, Absalom asked, why did my dad bring me here if he doesn't even want to speak with me? I'm sure a lot of us would be thinking that as well. Absalom was confused, he was angry, he was hurt. You know, they live in the same city, for goodness sake. And now David is turning his back on his own son that once before turned his back on him. And so things got so bad that Absalom began undermining everything David was doing. He was ruthless. There was nothing he wouldn't do to shame his dad, to try and destroy his dad and overthrow his dad. So Absalom turned the whole nation against David. In 2 Samuel 15, 14, it says this, when word got to David, he gathered up his officials and said, get up, we have to flee or we will not escape from Absalom. Leave quickly or he will soon overtake us, heap disaster on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. Absalom was determined, he was relentless and his bitterness had turned into blind rage and nothing would stop him. And David saw nothing better to do than just run away because Absalom had some men by his side as well. So some time passed, and David and his men were at Mahanaim, some complicated city names, where they came up with a plan to attack Absalom's men and bring an end to Absalom's pursuit. Before the men set out, David gathered his leaders and told them, be gentle with the young man Absalom for my sake. And all the troops heard the king giving orders concerning Absalom to each of the commanders. Joab knew that Absalom wouldn't. So... When he got his chance, Joab killed Absalom. David had been waiting and wondering. He had no idea what was going on. And when he saw the messenger coming towards him, when he saw the messenger coming towards him, he had no idea of the news that would be delivered. And when he got word that Absalom was dead, we read, and this is extremely important right here, in 2 Samuel 18.33, it says, The king was deeply moved and went up to the gate chamber and wept. As he walked, he cried, My son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Absalom, my son, my son. You know, the king was shaken. He was undone. He cried and he cried. He wailed with no regard, no concern whatsoever as to hurt him. Maybe some of you can relate. Maybe when you feel tears in your eyes and you're around people, you just want to get away into a room where nobody is. But David didn't even have the time to run away. He was walking and he just fell down and wept. He didn't care. His son was dead. If only I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. So this is a situation where we understand what's going on in David's mind. He has lost his son. In another instance, he's running away from Saul, who was king at the time, who's trying to kill him. And so now we go back to Psalm 62, and it's core of trusting in God. You know, trust is a really, really sticky subject. Um, Charles Spurgeon here has once said, a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. It's so easy to believe a lie. Why is this? Because blind acceptance takes so much less effort than testing with all of your brain. What lies are you putting your trust in today? It can be, it can be an endless, endless cycle, can it not? You know, put your trust in the world and it'll let you down. It's exhausting. 
And the promise, the process of gaining and then losing trust is extremely, extremely stressful. So let's just talk about anxiety for a second. Now, this is a safe place. This is a safe place. It's church, and there's no need to worry. So how many of you would say that fear and anxiety has in one way or another marked my life by a show of hands? Fear and anxiety. So let me see those hands. You know, look around, see those hands around you. Look back at me. You can put your hands down. You know, you're not alone in this process, in this, in this life. That in, in, it, in and of itself should be helpful. You know, thank goodness I was the only one who feared that I'm the only one struggling with fear and anxiety. You know, that was almost unanimous in here. I had a lot of hands here. So we have to do something with this fear and anxiety because it's not in line with God's good design for our lives because he loves us. Anxiety at its core is just a lack of trusting in God. This relates to what a refuge God is for those who he have created. God's intended plan was not for us to obsess and meditate on our own selfish desires, to only think about ourselves. He didn't create us to stress about how we need to cut the grass in the afternoon. He didn't create us uh, for us to stress about picking up milk after work and, oh, we still need to pick up some glue for little Johnny's art project. And it gets even harder when life gets real. He didn't create us so that we could worry about how your brother was just diagnosed with cancer or how your daughter doesn't want anything to do with Jesus. This is because when you understand who God is in his fullest and what he provides, the worry of the world melts into his loving arms. So Tyler, you're telling me that we're supposed to come here and just put on a church face, a happy church face, when really underneath, we're hurting underneath? By all means, no. The Christian life was never meant to be superficial. It was meant to be open and sincere. So when we understand who God is and what, he, and what we do with that, we can put our trust in him so that we can be sincere and open like the community I was once talking about. So why should we? Why should we? You're telling me to put my trust in an elevated tooth fairy? Well, Psalm 62 mentions who our God is exactly. Run to the word and understand the God who has given us some insight as to who we're actually dealing with here. Psalm 62 tells us that our God is our refuge. By looking at the simplest definition of refuge, we can see that a refuge is something providing shelter. Uh, refuge, protection, safety, security, sanctuary. I told you that I'm an outdoor enthusiast, I love the outdoors, and one of my favorite shows is Man vs. Wild featuring Bear Grylls. I love this guy. He's awesome. This is when he goes out into, into the nature, into the harsh environment, and he has to fend for himself and find his way to safety. He, he pretty much, if you guys have ever seen the show, he pretty much eats nasty, nasty bugs, and he tries to build his own shelter, as you can see here. So he's taking some leaves, some branches, and making his own shelter. Maybe, if you can relate, maybe you like the um, Survivor Man show. I just love these shows, seeing these guys just fend for themselves. A refuge is a place of safe retreat or of, of shelter. It's a place where you can escape from danger, where you can find protection from the pursuit of an enemy. Or maybe it's kind of like a castle. Castles serve the purpose as defending yourself from the pursuit of an enemy outside the castle walls. Or in today's term, it's an escape and resolve from the stress and disappointments that life brings, that it inevitably will. So as I wrap up here, I want to give you three principles for the refuge the psalm mentions here. So principle one, we need a divine refuge, a divine refuge. We're talking about what to place our hope and trust in. I ask you, what are you placing your hope and trust in today? David explains in verse 1 and 2, I am at rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. And again, he alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. He alone is my strength and my salvation. David explains that something greater than he 
or anything else in this world for that matter, is where he places his trust, his anchor, his salvation. And if we don't understand where our hope is placed or if our understanding of this refuge doesn't uh, have some depth or have some root and an anchor to it, then when the troubles of the world hit you, you won't have any foundation or any refuge to protect you or stand on. You know we already have a natural inclination to rebel against God. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Before Christ, you dwell in a body of sin and death. And what Josh was talking about last week is that when you fully understand this sin, it's not too hard to think about the shame and the guilt you feel about that. And so when you understand the sin in its fullness, it's easy to feel that guilt. We are helpless to deliver ourselves from this infection that we have. Psalm 62, 9 says, Men are only a vapor. Exalted men and illusion, weighed in the scales, they go up, together they are less than a vapor. Why place your trust in yourself when you will maybe live on this earth about 80, 90 years tops? One day you're going to be here, and the other day you're going to be gone. It's a sad fact. It's a good fact, too. And so the substance of this teaching is that when men, by their very nature, are they're, they're but a breath. And likewise, riches, however gained, are a delusion. For to God alone belong all power and goodness. And he rewards each person according to their works. Not only is, it, is there this very sin that infects us, but in addition, no believer or unbeliever alike can escape the hardships of life as well. The man, the woman, dwells in a corrupt world. Job 5, 7 says, man, and, a man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. It's kind of depressing. As soon as a baby is born, he's born, she is born into trouble. You know, the list goes on through life. It goes on and on. Personal losses, family losses, financial trouble, and it keeps going and going. I tell the students so many times is that this life, I'm sorry to say, is not full of, is not full of candy canes and rainbows. You know, this... This life is hard. You turn on the nightly news and it won't take long for you to figure that out. There are addictions in this place. There are fears in this place. There are people here struggling with depression. But David, he doesn't write, he doesn't write about placing our hope in the bottom of a beer bottle. David doesn't tell his readers that they should bow down to the opinions of others. David doesn't tell you to place your hope in anything in this world. Why is this? Because it will fail you. If you only, you know, these things in the world, it only brings momentary satisfaction. It promises so much, but then it, every single time it under delivers. Why play this, why play in this cycle of disappointments when you can find true satisfaction somewhere else? Which brings us to our next point. Principle two, our God is the very definition of this refuge. You need a refuge. You need a safe haven that isn't found on this earth. I tell you, friend, we need no other refuge but God. God is this refuge and strength. Again, he alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. In Old Testament times, there are appointed cities of refuge. God is such a refuge. Think of the king of the universe as a refuge, suitable, strong, effectual, easy of access, and unfailing. My last principle was depressing, sadly, but it was true. But yet, in our affliction, in our addictions, in our fear, God met us right where we were, right in the middle of our junk. God sends Christ to be the righteousness that we couldn't be. <laughs> right in the middle of our junk, the refuge we would need, the strength that we would need. Because why? Because your righteousness, you at your very, very best, is never going to be adequate to cancel the record of debt that you have. You're never going to be good enough to save yourself. So God sends Jesus Christ to earth his own son to die the death that we deserved. And the true defining moment of Christ's power was when he did what no man could do. 
he conquered death and defied the expectations of those who had seen him brutally beaten three days earlier. Any other man, Confucius, he's gone. Buddha, he's gone too. What about the prophet Muhammad? He's gone. All of these religious leaders, all of these men are all gone. But God in his infinite power comes forth from the grave in the most intense moment in human history. He's alive. He rose from the dead and our faith depends on that very same power and mercy that he gives. And so our salvation and trust must always depend on Christ, nothing else. So Psalm 62, 7 says, My salvation and glory depend on God, my strong rock. My refuge is in God. We must always build our lives on Jesus Christ, who is a solid foundation that will never, ever fail. This is why we should constantly seek to know God and his faithful love. Which brings me to my last and third point. Principle three, to enjoy this refuge, we must run to it. To live in God's will as individuals and as communities of faith, we must not only understand God's power, but we must experience that power for ourselves. This is taking mere thought to action. I can read all I want on aviation guidelines and aviation regulations and the ins and outs of any plane, but until I step into that cockpit of that plane and begin to take a piece of metal into the air, which I still don't understand, it still freaks me out, do I then call myself a pilot? In the same way, understanding this information isn't enough. So what are you going to do with this information? It's so easy to feel empowered on Sunday morning, so encouraged, being surrounded by a community of believers, but then it's so, so easy to forget this on Monday evening after a hard day of work. As simple as it sounds, as simple as it sounds, we must be in his word and consistently and sincerely praying for his refuge to surround us. We must be in it. To be only near this refuge is of no avail. When we take refuge in God, he will give us grace to fight the good war. He will give us strength to win. And this is what we do. We worship God and submit to him as our true refuge. David worships God in Psalm 19.3. He says, my lips will praise you, for you are better than life. You are better than life. Paul captured this Old Testament truth when he wrote his letter to the the, uh, church in Corinth. Paul was writing, about some thorn in the flesh that he battled. Go figure, a difficulty in life, big surprise. Paul said that he asked the Lord three times to take it away from him. Paul says, just remove it once and for all so I don't ever have to deal with the battle ever again, God. That's what he says in 2 Corinthians. I'm going to read this for you. It's 12, 8 through 10. It says, concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weakness so that Christ's power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in weakness. I take pleasure in insults. I take pleasure in catastrophes, persecutions, pressures because of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God did something much more powerful than remove every piece of the battle. He said, I'm going to be your strength, and I'm going to be your power to fight your battle and win the victory. Do you recognize why this is so much more powerful than God throwing us out of the battle? You know, whatever it is, whatever it is that we've battled in the past or are battling in the present or will battle in the future, if God settled it once and for all, then we would just head down the road and forget all about God. We just mainly think about ourselves. By God not ridding you and me of of the battle once and for all, he's inviting us to walk with him in an ever-growing trust and dependence. From mountaintop to mountaintop and through every single valley that we have in our lives, he will be our help. He will be our strength and our refuge in every single time of need. So won't you trust in him today? Today is the day of salvation. Won't you renounce your self-reliance and cling to Jesus 
as your sole source of salvation and strength because everything else fails, I tell you, friend. Why? Because he alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Let's pray. God, we love you so much. We thank you for revealing this truth to us in Psalm 62. We ask, God, that we would trust you and have an ever-growing trust and dependence. I pray for the people here who don't really believe in you or don't really know if you're true or what's going on, but I pray, God, that you would help them. Give the people, surround them with community here in this church. Let this place be an area that which they can grow and understand exactly who you are. I pray that you would guide us through this week. Help us not to forget this information um, even tomorrow night or even after this Sunday service. I pray that you would guide us, God. Give us wisdom and strength because strength ultimately only comes from you. So we ask for your grace and your presence through this week. And we love you so much, Jesus. In your name, amen.